that we looked at the, the con this concept of covenants uh, being very, very important, especially during this time uh, of the pandemic when everybody is shaken, not only in Uganda, but globally, uh, our faith has been shaken because this pandemic has affected people world over. And the, the people of God, uh, our, our fallback position is this covenant because we are in covenant with God. We can stand strong and firm. We can stand and, 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 and still trust that the fact that we know the Lord and the Lord knows us, we cannot be shaken. In any situation, we have our anchor. We looked at the anchor, the anchor of our souls is this covenant where we know God has made promises which are yea and amen in him. These promises remain the anchor, our trust, and the, and, and the, the, the purpose or purposes of God for whatever is taking place now in the world shall stand. And when those purposes are accomplished, we still remain joyful and happy because we know that the Lord cannot let us down. He promised to protect and provide for us in the midst of every situation, including this pandemic. When we started this covenant uh, sharing or teaching, we saw that uh, the reason for covenant comes from God's desire to have a relationship of personal intimacy with man. How can a God like we have, the infinite God desire to have a relationship with us, finite men and women, people who are so limited, who are so small, because he made us with, with his image. Let us make man in our image. He made us in our image, in his image. So he desires to have that intimacy with us because we have his DNA. We are special. We are special creation, different from any other creation, including angels. Angels are servants. They are not made in God's image. We are made in his image. And because you are made in his image, we are sons. Both men and women, we are sons. We are sons of God. And because we are sons of God, we are going to be heirs. Because we are going to be heirs, we will rule with him. Angels will serve us because we have been exalted to that level. This, this, this is a very, very important aspect. And this covenant was uh, prepared by God before the foundations of the world. And we're looking at that uh, as, as the, the covenant sealed in blood. The book of Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 says that this blood was shed before the foundations of the world. It doesn't make sense to us here who live in time when we say that the blood uh, was shed before the foundation of the world or that Jesus was crucified uh, before the foundations of the world. What does that mean when we know 2,000 years ago he was brought to the cross and he was crucified? How can it then be uh, done before the foundations of the world? Because what happened uh, on the cross was done in the power of the eternal spirit. We are told that he offered himself through the eternal spirit. Once you say that, then you are you trace same time. Then whatever is done at that moment now goes back into eternity and now it can go back what and of front you know it is it transcends time it goes beyond time it can go right back and in front and and what god did accomplish on the cross because it was done in the, through the eternal spirit now it can be taken back to have happened before because eternity does not have time we also saw that the blood because jesus offered himself through the eternal spirit they never loses its power, whether it washes one person or it washes seven billion people who are on earth now or more. That blood never loses its power because he offered himself through the eternal spirit. Also, that blood does not lose power today, tomorrow, or the other day. It's still the same blood. After washing so many people, it still has the same efficacy as it had before. Before you wash, it is the same. You can't say, oh, you people have used the blood and now it, 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 it has lost because you have overused it. No, it's, that is the power of the blood we've been 
discussing the power of the covenant blood. Only God could arrange such uh, uh, salvation. The power of the blood. We've been looking at the power of the blood. It's cleansing. But also yesterday, apart from the blood, we saw that he also, Jesus also came by the, whole, the, the, the word. He didn't come only by the blood. The cleansing takes place by the blood, but it also takes place by the word. Two cleansings, by the blood and by the word. So yesterday we were looking at the, the word, uh, importance of the word, uh, and the process of confessing it, declaring it, uh, and how that word cleanses us believers, how believers are cleansed by the word. We looked at several scriptures, and I'm not going to go back on that. Uh, but also we saw that we are born again uh, by the incorruptible seed of God's word. That's the first day you came to the Lord. Somebody preached, the scriptures preached and the word and, and the Holy Spirit took that word as a seed and you are born again. Number two is that word that we live by. The faith to live by comes from the word. Jesus spoke those, those words to Satan when he answered and said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word or rema that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Rema is the word that God is speaking right now. So we live by that every day. If you hear God's word on a daily basis, you grow. God is speaking to us every day. That's what he demonstrated to the Jews in the wilderness. When he uh, give the manna every day, falling from heaven every day. That's what he does even to them. Your manna falls from heaven every day, every day. Whether you hear it or understand it or not is another matter. But he sends a word for you to live by every day. It may come in a vision. It may come in a dream. It may come in a song. It can, can come when you are meditating in the word and a particular verse stands out. There are so many ways God speaks to us, even through other people, through our spouses, through our children, even strangers, even a lunatic uh, 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 standing on the street. God can use them to, to speak a word to you that you need that day to live by. Every day, God sends the word. If people or believers are sensitive to live by that word, then you really grow very fast. That word is sent uh, to enable us face the challenges of life and make us grow. And, and the, our growth is really determined by the amount of God's word that we hide in our lives or that we receive. If you don't receive that word and you, don't know, you do not exercise yourself to receiving it, you are living on sterile bread. In Uganda, we call it amaolu. Uh, when children eat amaolu, they get stunted. Their stomachs are huge and their heads are small. Uh, they are stunted because there is no nutrition in maolu. Maolu, uh, stale food, does not give nutrition, so it, it just fills the stomach. Children in the villages have big stomachs and very small heads uh, and, and skinny bodies, emaciated because they are not feeding well. They're malnutrited. So it's malnutrition in the spirit uh, comes when we do not receive that engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Our souls are being saved daily. Our spirits were saved. Our souls are being saved daily. Our bodies will be saved in the future. Daily, we have to receive that engrafted word to keep our souls being saved daily. And then we grow. And then we are well nurtured. We are, we are, we are, we are, we are feeding very well. That's God, God's intention for all of us, to grow in him. This is the word. The word continually feeds us and cleanses us, cleanses us from bad attitudes, from uh, uh, we get the biblical worldview. That is another type of cleansing different from what the blood does. The blood washes us from sin, but the word continually cleanses us as we, 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 live, we walk with the Lord on a daily basis. Uh, as babies, we feed on the milk of God's word. Then we get strengthened. Then we mature. We saw the process of maturity that we go into many stages as, as we grow from Nepios, which is the baby stage, to Pideon, 
to to uh, uh, then the the Neoniscos, then the Hughes. We saw those levels in the Bible uh, that uh, uh, as even Jesus went through them. We looked at those levels that you we must desire to keep growing because we can't just say because I got saved 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, spiritual maturity is not really counted by years. It's counted by how much of God's word flows out of you. It's the life of God in us, the life of Jesus in us. So the word becomes very, very, very important in what God is doing in our lives. So covenants are, are sealed by the blood, that is true, but there are principles to live by. These principles working in covenant, uh, we saw that that's the word called righteousness, right? Righteousness is a relationship word. One who is working in covenant is the one who is righteous. In the Bible, uh, Noah is righteous because he's working in covenant. So covenant is a righteous word in the Hebrew uh, context or understanding when it says so and so as righteous, what it means is that he's working in covenant. And, and covenant involves understanding that word, the word of God, the word of the, uh, the Lord, which he gives to us so that we can walk in his covenant, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's important to understand uh, and walk in the word. The word, we have to walk in it, we have to read it, we have to study it. And I summarized it yesterday, that it comes to us in five ways. We hear it, one, two, we read it. Three, we study it. Four, we memorize it. And five, we meditate on it. Those five ways, hearing it, reading it, studying it, memorizing it, and meditating on it. In those five, the, the word enters us, enters our lives, and then it transforms us and cleanses us. And, and we saw in the book of Ephesians chapter five that Jesus is doing that with his bride. Husbands, love your wives as Jesus loved the church and gave himself for her so that he may cleanse her by the washing of the water, by the word, and present her to himself, a glorious church, without spot or wrinkle, any such thing, that he may present it to himself, a glorious church, eh? cleansed and washed. So that cleansing, uh, many people don't appreciate that cleansing, and so they don't take the word of God important. So as long as I use the blood to be cleansed, they don't understand the other type of cleansing, which is also part and parcel of the covenant. Now, today, I want to continue to look at, uh, we are looking at, the, remember, we are looking at the covenant, uh, and we are looking at, specifically, I'm going to go back to the blood because of its power to deal with uh, uh, the enemy, the enemy's attack on our lives how the devil uses sin to affect our lives, to affect our progress. We need to understand these truths because knowledge is power. Uh, God delivers us through knowledge. My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. So Satan uses ignorance, God uses knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, meaning the devil is destroying them because they don't have knowledge. So when God comes to deliver us, he gives us the truth the truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We are set free by the truth. Uh, the impact of this sin, of sin in our lives, uh, keeps us in bondage. And the devil's major weapon is sin uh, and ignorance. God's major weapon is a truth. Truth, he brings the truth, because truth gives us faith. When Satan keeps us in darkness, he keeps us in fear. Fear is to Satan what faith is to God. Faith pulls God to you, calls God to you, attracts God to you. Fear attracts Satan. So when you are in ignorance, you have fear. When you are in faith, you attract God. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. Uh, while fear comes by ignorance of his word. So we, we want to know now, how does uh, sin operate in our, in our lives and how Satan uses it uh, to, to, to hinder us and why God has given us the blood? Why is the blood so important? Is because the, of the impact of sin in our lives. Now, the New Testament uh, uses five words to define the word sin. Well, the Old Testament 
uses 12 different words, a total of 17. Uh, there's so many to go through each one of them, but I've summarized them into seven categories and then reduced them into three. That helps us to summarize it in a simple way so that it can make, make it simple for everybody. Uh, and, and I've put them in different three different colors. The three categories are, are summarized in Psalms 51. And in Psalms 51, all the three categories are mentioned and I've put them in the three categories. The first one is transgression, the second is sin, and the third is iniquity. Now, transgression, what is transgression? That is a deliberate act of rebellion. When you do something deliberately, you know it is wrong, that is a transgression. So uh, <clears throat> I hope you are, you are able to see my screen. I want to be sure that you yes. can see. Okay. We can see very well. Okay. Then uh, uh, the number two is sin. Sin is missing the mark. You target to hit a, a you, are, you want to, uh, to hit a target and you miss it. In the Bible, that is sin. You, you desire to meet a certain target or standard and you can't, or you miss it. That is sin. All of us have missed the target. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God, so all of us have sinned. The third is iniquity. This is our inherited condition from Adam. We saw earlier on that all of us are a multiplication of Adam's fallen life. When Adam fell, uh, he, he, he forfeited the position he had. His life was corrupted. And unfortunately, I had not had any children that time. All of us came after the fall. Had one of the children been born before the fall, that should, child would have been free from, the, from this iniquity. But all of us were in him before uh, uh, the fall. I mean, his fall was before the, he, he produced children after the fall. We all come after the fall. So that's why all of us have iniquity. We have inherited this condition of, of crookedness. Our bios life, which we call the natural life, bios life is that is, is the crooked life, the fallen life of Adam. And we, we saw that in the book of Acts chapter 17, verse 26, where the Bible says that from one blood, from one man, Adam, all the face of the earth has been populated. So all of us, have come with that iniquity, with that condition. So now let's break them down again. Let's go back to transgression. Transgression, there are two uh, categories. I mean, yes, there are two categories uh, of, of transgression. One is unbelief, a deliberate rejection of a biblical truth. And we see that in Romans 14, 23. So that is a transgression. There is a truth, a biblical truth clearly uh, articulated, explained, but you reject it. Or you don't believe, like when we preach the gospel, people don't, uh, they don't believe, they don't accept. That is a transgression. And number two, a deliberate act against the law of God. And we see that in First John 3, 4. Yeah, so one is inside you, uh, unbelief, a deliberate rejection, another is an act. They are both transgression. One is unbelief within, rejecting a biblical truth. Another is an act against a known biblical truth, or you, you know the law of God, you shall not murder, and you go and murder. You shall not commit adultery, and you commit adultery. So that is uh, uh, a, a, a transgression. Now, rebellion uh, in, the, uh, in the Greek, the Greek word for rebellion is apatheo. And the Greek word for unbelief is apistia. You notice that they have the same root. The same root, which in English is apathy. So when you say unbelief uh, in, 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 in when defining transgression, we actually are talking about the same thing in as far as the Bible is concerned. Unbelief and rebellion are the same, one and the same. That's why when God was dealing with those 10 spies, 
we, we see he, he calls them they were they came back with an evil report he charged them of unbelief and rebellion psalms 95 uh, specifically talks about their rebellion because unbelief to god is rebellion that's what makes it a transgression when you are unbelieving that is apistia you are also rebellious so the bible calls the rebellious generation of, of which didn't enter the promised land it also calls them the unbelieving that I, I i swore in my anger that they will never enter my rest because they disbelieved they they rejected my truth they rebelled against me so you need to see that from god's perspective all unbelief is rebellion all unbelief is rebellion so unbelief is a rebellion a deliberate rejection of a biblical truth. Okay, then we go to sin. Sin, remember, is the missing of the mark. And so when we neglect a known duty or opportunity, that is missing the mark, that is sin. You neglect a known duty or an opportunity that you should take hold of and you don't, that is sin. Then the other number four is a mental consent to a temptation or desire. One is neglect, another one is consenting to a temptation or a desire. Remember when Jesus was teaching that if you look at a, a woman and you lust after her, you've already committed adultery with her or fornication with her. In, in the Bible, sin is both, uh, I mean, is, is, is speech thought and action now this is the, uh, the 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 thought the thought aspect both of them neglect you are supposed to take on the duty and you didn't do it but this one is a mental consent to a temptation or desire then the third one is doing the wrong thing out of ignorance so in missing the mark we commit the sin in those three ways by neglecting duties opportunities by consenting to temptations and desires or by doing the wrong thing out of ignorance you don't know that something is wrong and you do it that is already seen leviticus 5 17 says if you do something wrong without knowing it still does not absolve you that is not sin it's already seen and you are still responsible because you did it you are, you did it you there was a responsibility because you did it you took action to do it uh, and out of ignorance remember satan works through ignorance and it is by our ignorance that we are destroyed my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge so the devil takes advantage of human humanity's ignorance to keep it in bondage okay now those are five uh, so far the last two are under iniquity the last two the sinful nature we inherited from adam that one is clear that is iniquity that nature we inherited and there is a force in our sin that sinful nature which makes us slaves to sin these are just called habits habits sometimes we, we contribute to to, for, to these habits you start smoking and you get addicted you start uh, uh, taking weeds and you get addicted and so on and so forth but they are, are, are stemming from this nature which we already have from adam so these seven categories summarize sin so when you look at sin from this angle you realize it it, it just takes the power of god to fully deliver us really because how do we escape all these many uh, 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 these categories. If, if you don't miss the mark tomorrow, uh, today, tomorrow you are unbelieving, you hear the truth today and you can't put it in practice. All these are sins. When you look at them, really, how, how can a human being be able to live without sin? And that's what most people see when they have looked at this. Sometimes we look at sin in a very limited way, and so we don't really fully understand it. 
And so we don't fully appreciate the salvation that we have received. We don't fully uh, appreciate the power of the blood to save us because we have a limited understanding. That's why we need to see uh, sin from God's perspective. All this is sin. It's so perverse, pervasive, very pervasive in almost every aspect of our area, when we are thinking, when we are speaking, when we are doing. So this, this is all sin. And so when God comes to save, he wants to save us to the uttermost. The Bible says he wants to save us to the uttermost. That's why he had to use a very powerful weapon called the blood. The blood will handle all this to save us. And on the cross, that's what Jesus was doing. And he knew we would never save ourselves. That's why if God was to save us by our own acts, none of us would be saved. And the Bible clearly says by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Why? We are all uh, uh, born iniquitous. Yeah? That third category. Yeah? That, that third category, iniquity, we are born iniquity. So even when you come to sing, you have a wrong motive for sing. Even when you come to worship, then you are, your motive is, is, so there is always corruption there. Even when you are giving in the, uh, in the, they are passing a basket for offering, uh, there, there could be some bad motives. Even when you are, we are raising money for something, you want to uh, give more than the other person. The motive is not really to please God, but to please people or to show off. You see, there are so, so many things in us because of our iniquity, because of the way this in the full nature. It's so difficult for us to live a righteous life by our own self, by our own uh, uh, efforts. It takes God himself who has given us the, the, that incorruptible seed of his word, of his life in us, which we called Zoe. When we were discussing, he gave us the Zoe life of Jesus Christ in us, which life is incorruptible, the life which cannot sin. Again, as such, there is no law. That, that life does not have any problem. That cannot be corrupted by evil. It's the very life of God. That is the life which he gave you so that it can, uh, uh, you, you can live in, you feed it with his word so that it, 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 it because it has no sin in it, it flourishes, and so you live a righteous life. That is God's method. But initially, it comes to deal with this condition. These seven categories are difficult to, to uh, escape by our own strength, by our own effort. Now, let's look at, again, the impact of sin. These seven categories, uh, the first five, which is, uh, 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 transgression and sin involve guilt because we choose. Guilt involves choice and therefore responsibility. Those first five, let me go back to five, the unbelief or a deliberate rejection of a biblical truth, two, a deliberate act against the law of God, three, neglect of known duties or opportunities, for a mental consent to a temptation or desire, and five, doing the wrong thing out of ignorance. Those five involve guilt because there is always a choice on your side. It's because you have a choice there that therefore you are responsible, therefore you are guilty. Now, the other remaining two categories under iniquity, which we inherited at birth because of the fall do not involve guilt. You didn't choose to be born like that. You found yourself born. Therefore, you, God, God doesn't charge you because of your condition. You didn't choose it. There's no choice involved. You just found yourself born uh, with that iniquitous. You don't teach a, baby, a child to be noted, do you? Eh? Children are noted, they do this, they, misbehave, nobody taught them, even when they're still young, because the condition, that condition is inborn. Even when they don't have uh, understanding, that, that, that notiness is right there. So they do not, that, 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 that those two do not involve guilt. Or therefore, if there is no guilt, there is no responsibility, but there is condemnation because we are under condemned world. 
and Roman 5, 18 tells us so. So those two categories, uh, the, the, the number six and seven under iniquity, it's important that do not involve guilt. But what does it then involve if it, there's no guilt for us being born? It makes us sinners by nature and therefore could disqualify us from heaven because that condition is not allowed there. Therefore, it has to be your choice in number one to get out. God has made provision for you. You were born a sinner, but he made a, a, a he gave you opportunity to walk out of that condition. He gave you opportunity to be saved. He, he so in number one here, you are born with the six and seven, but he gives you opportunity to walk out. So if you don't walk out, the real problem is not six and seven. The problem is number one, because God has made a provision for you to escape that, but you've refused. I hope that comes out clear. Six and seven, we don't have a choice. We don't are not responsible. But we are responsible only if we do, we have unbelief because we've refused. Let me put it this way. Um, when you go to Rosilla Maximum Prison, there is a section which they call condemned. Condemned are those people who have been brought to court, evidence has been fully abused, and they are guilty, and they are uh, going to be executed. Their, their sentence is execution. So they have a section and it's called the condemned section. Suppose you go to that condemned section and you feel, find people who are condemned and you give them opportunity to walk out. Actually, the president is given what they call the prerogative of mercy. Prerogative of mercy gives the president a final power to say something about all those people who are in the condemned section. He can use his prerogative of mercy to release any of them, uh, any of them. And, and so he comes to use his prerogative of mercy and declares that uh, I've released so and so. Recently, we, we saw the testimony of our brother, Rakasis, Chris Rakasis, who was on the death row, waiting for execution any day. And he, well, the president said he was going to sign and he felt something telling him not to sign. While not knowing, uh, during that period when uh, Chris Rakasis was in prison, he had gotten saved and they prayed and God had, you know, he had, he had gotten saved and, uh, and, and then the president said, no, uh, I'm, I'm releasing that man. So he, he released him and he walked out of prison. Now he's preaching the gospel. He was on the death row. The president used this prerogative of mercy to release him. What if he refused? And he did not walk out. What if uh, Brother Rakasisi said, no, I'm not walking out. I was, yeah, I'm, I'm here. So whose problem would it, would it be? It would be his problem because he has remained in the condemned section when there is opportunity to walk out. When uh, there is a prerogative of mercy declared upon you to walk out and you have refused and you remained inside you can't blame anybody. So there was a prerogative of mercy that Jesus' death on the cross provided for the whole human race. That's what the Bible says. He died for the whole human race. The whole human race has opportunity to walk out. The whole human race can seize that opportunity. Number three, you, they, they, they neglect that opportunity to walk out. That is sin. Or unbelief, number one, yeah, transgression when they deliberately reject the fact that they, they have been given a prerogative of mercy to walk out. So you notice that we are born with iniquity, that is uh, category six and seven. That one, we do not have any responsibility because we didn't choose. We were born in Adam, it wasn't our choice. But our choice comes when we commit category number one and category number three when we do not walk out of the condemned section, when there is, we, have, uh, uh, we are unbelieving, we deliberately reject the prerogative of mercy and we remain in the condemned section until the time of execution and they were, we, then we are executed. Or we neglect an opportunity that has been given to us to walk out. So when people refuse to be born again, 
they have committed category number one and category number three. It's category number one and number three that causes people to go to hell. It's not six and seven. Their nature inherited from Adam or the force that is working in them. So sin, therefore, the real only sin that takes people to hell, therefore, becomes uh, the, the transgression and the sin, not iniquity. Iniquity is the condition we're born in, but the sin of rejecting the liberty truth and lacking the, the, neglecting the opportunity that has been given is what actually causes people to go to hell. Uh, I, this is a very difficult topic for many people, I'm sure, but that is what the Bible teaches. And what I've done is to put all these verses there so that if you're sufficiently interested and you should go back and spend enough time going through each one of them. I'm trying to simplify it so that everybody can, uh, because we have a limited time here, take time to go through this again and again and again and again. And if you can, share it in the family, share it with others, ask questions, uh, discuss it. It helps you when you discuss it, or whatever you've understood. You discuss it and, and, and understand it better. If as a family of colleagues, we can discuss this matter. The reason po po people take sin lightly sometimes because they don't understand the pervasiveness of it, but also what God has done through the blood. When we, we see this, we, we appreciate God's power. Why did God give us the law? To see our utter, utter uh, uh, desperation so that we can fully appreciate grace. Until you have seen the law and its demands and its justice, you can't appreciate grace. The same with this. If you can't, you have not fully understood the, the, the power of sin and how it works so deep in our lives, you will not appreciate what God has done by giving us the, the blood. We need to understand how Satan uses all these sins to keep us in bondage, to have access in our lives, to keep us uh, uh, totally desperate, but also look at the blood. Now, when we sing the blood, it makes sense because we see how God has forgiven us, how he has given us opportunity to be free and so on and so forth. That's why we learn, why, why we, we needed to uh, teach and, and learn or meditate or study all that he has done for us. So we looked at that, let me repeat. Category one to five involve guilt because there is a choice, your personal choice. And guilt involves choice and responsibility. While category six and seven, which we inherited at birth because of the fault, do not involve guilt or responsibility, but only involve condemnation. In other words, we are condemned section. Those who don't believe are already in the condemned section. The Bible says so. And I'm going to look at that in more detail. Uh, category six and seven also makes us sinners by nature. Everybody, including children, they are made, they are sinners by birth. And therefore, because we are sinners, it disqualifies us from heaven. Now, let's go to the third level. Uh, what sin includes? It includes five elements. The first one is responsibility because there is a choice. Because you are responsible, because there is a choice, therefore you are responsible. And when, once you are responsible, you are also guilty. When you stand before a judge, the first question is always, uh, you, they ask you for your plea. What are you saying about these charges that have been brought against you? You say, yes, I am guilty or I am not. And what you are saying in effect is that, yes, I am responsible because I made that choice to do this. That is guilt. Guilt is you are saying either I'm responsible or I'm not responsible because there is always a choice. If you are guilty, then there is conviction. The judge will convict you and say, yes, based on what you have said or based on the evidence adduced, you've been convicted. Come back next week, I'm going to declare my sentence. The sentence is the punishment. But we see there is responsibility, there is guilt, there is conviction. Now, you, you please understand that the Bible is the book of the law. When God was speaking to 
Joshua, he said, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. For lawyers and judges, these are uh, words that are very, very common and easy. For some of us who are lay people, it may be a little bit difficult. But the better, the more you understand this, the better the Bible makes sense. And, and so understanding them helps you to appreciate what you are dealing with. So all these words are used in the Bible in the sense that we use it, we use them in the uh, uh, legal realm or in courts uh, uh, in, and in law. So there's a conviction there. And, and we're going to look at all of them. Once you are convicted, then your sentence. Sentence is the punishment. Now the word sentence in court, of course, is the punishment. And in court, you are given different types of sentence, six months imprisonment or execution or uh, lifelong imprisonment, or you are told you are going to pay penalty. There are so many sentences in courts. But in God's judgment, when it comes to sin, there's only one sentence, the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death, which is eternal death. There's no other sentence. Whether the sin is very small, when the, whether the sin is medium, whether the sin is grave, big, murder, aggravated murder, all of them, the sentence is the same. Uh, bad attitude is a sin, and its sentence is death, eternal death, eternal separation, hell. Whether it's a word, unkind word, it is sinful, yes. What is its sentence? Death, eternal separation from God. Now, when people don't see this, normally that's why they come to say, ah, for me, I'm not so bad. You know, I'm not so, they don't understand that however small a sin they commit is, its sentence is death. Now, because every sentence, every sin, uh, the sentence of every sin is death, all of us needed salvation. Whether you are a small sinner, a medium sinner, a big sinner, what, all of them, their sentence is death. So the Bible clearly says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. That word is also the same word used, condemnation or damnation. Condemnation, damnation, eternal death, wages of sin, all those mean the same thing. So when you are reading the Bible in the New Testament and you find any of those words, they mean the same thing. Eternal death, damnation, condemnation, or wages of sin, and sentence of sin, it's all, it all means the same. It means the punishment of sin. Okay, let me read a few of them. Let me just mention them because of time we can't go and read them, but I, I've put them here. I've, I've put them down. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. Clearly, the wages of sin is death. That is talking about damnation, eternal damnation uh, and condemnation. Ezekiel 18, 20 says the soul that sins, it shall die. Every soul that has sinned. Now, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means all of us we are destined to die. The soul that sins, it shall die. Every soul that sinned shall die. So all of us sinned, all of us were condemned. John 3.18. Now those ones, I need to read them. So let me go to them so we can see how important, how powerful our salvation is. Why is the blood, why do we keep uh, thanking God so much for the blood is because of what has been achieved on our behalf. Powerful. Satan was so sure that he has all of us in his grip. All of us have sinned or had fallen short of the glory of God, all the human race. He said, aha, now let me see. These people you love here, they are all going to hell. I know you have made this hell for me uh, and my angels because we sinned against you. But the moment you throw me into this hell that you are talking about, the moment you throw me there, these human beings whom you love, 
so much will have to be thrown there too. Your justice requires so. That's what made the devil so sure of, of, of hurting God because he knew there was no way of escape. The soul that sinners, it shall die. And all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, whether, whether small sin, medium sin, or big sin. So how do you get over that is what was accomplished on the cross. Now we are reading John chapter 3, verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned. Not that word condemned. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Notice that condemnation is not because of what you've done. No, everybody has sinned. I have sinned, you have sinned, the wicked have sinned, the murderers have sinned, the, everybody has sinned, the whole world has sinned. But what exactly makes people to be condemned is none of those things, because God knew we would. By virtue of our birth, by virtue of our origin, by virtue of the fact that we all come from Adam, all of us have sinned. So that's not the cause of condemnation. The cause of condemnation is not because we have sinned, murdered, committed adultery. No, none of them. Even now, you still commit some small sin. They may not be as that big, but a bad attitude, a, you know, unkindness, all those things we still do, commit them. Yet all of them, the wages of all of those, however small, their wages is sin. Yes. Sorry, their wages is death. Because their wages is death, the, God has to make a solution, to give us a solution. So you see, it is he who believes in him. He who believes in him is not condemned. So it, the, 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 the escape, the way of escape is believing in Jesus. He who does not believe in him is already condemned. Very, very important truth. Why is he condemned? Because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten of God, of, of the Son of God. Let's go back to that template again. Notice that why people go to hell is none of the many sins that have been uh, uh, committed. Yeah? The, the, the sins they have committed eh, are not the real issue. The real issue is uh, category number one, unbelief, a deliberate rejection of a biblical truth. God understands that we would commit those sins we commit. He's not shocked because we have uh, iniquity, six and seven. We come from iniquitous background. If you come from Bukunja, you'll be a nighty dancer because that's what your great grandfathers have been doing for generations. Hundreds of generations, they have been nighty dancing, eating dead bodies, cannibals, what, 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 what. You come from a family who are full of hatred and murders and what. Or you come from a family who are full of fornication, adultery. All your family is adulterous. And so he, he doesn't condemn you because of what, where you came from. You, you never decided to come from that family, which is so full of sin, full of murder, full of this. There are families which are in bondage to all these things. And we, you find yourself born before you even come to understand. Yeah? We have a brother, he told us for us, in our family, uh, 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 the, the baby is given a mandule. A mandule is that, <laughs> is that um, waraji, which is tough. I said, he said, yeah, when, when I diluted the waraj, he yeah, said, when, when I was about three years old, I was given a mandala. So we started, to, we started to drink long before. And then now you can imagine that if, if, if that is the family you're coming from, yeah, at, before age three, you already started the mandala. You can imagine. Yeah. Then others, another brother is telling me, when I was at school, I, I, you know, I went with a girl and then I, I impregnated her. I was still in primary. I was so scared. He said, I was so scared my father would be mad at me. So he, man, he had the, 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 the rumor and then he called me and said, my son, hmm, is what I hear 
And then, you know, I, I was so shocked. He said, I was afraid. He said, yeah, don't worry. Uh, if you ever have another one, just bring them, bring. He said, yeah, so that is what happened. So he went on a rampage and he started. So you can imagine that kind of family you're coming from. That even encourages you to go and impregnate other girls and what? So you, you, you think about that situation. We come from these families. We come from these backgrounds. If God was to judge us, we would say, oh, Lord, you are unfair. Because look at where you placed me. Look at this place you placed me here in, in Ibukunja. Hmm? Why didn't you place me somewhere else where they are not, they don't have this problem of, of Kusera, eh? night dancing, what, what. So, so he knew all of us would come from those backgrounds. And so he does not judge us because of that. The only reason people are condemned is because they have not taken advantage of walking out of the condemned section. We, we've, we've read that part which says that, uh, I'm going back to that scripture again, you excuse me, going back and forth. He who believes in him is not condemned. Notice it's a present tense. Once you believe in him immediately from that moment on, you've switched from condemnation section, now you've walked out. He who does not believe remains in the condemned section. So everybody you see who is not born again is already in the condemned section. Whether they know it or not is another matter. They, they don't know that they're already in the condemned section, but they are already in the condemned section because they have not taken advantage or they have not believed on the son of the living God. They have they are already condemned, they are just waiting execution. The death, when they die here on earth, that is not the execution. The execution is yet to come. But now that death is so important because once you die, you have no more opportunity to walk out of the condemned section. That's not the real uh, execution. No, physical death is not the real execution. The only reason is so important is because from that moment on, you no longer have any choice to walk out. You only have a choice to walk out while you're still here on earth. That's why you have to preach while people are still alive. When people are still alive, they have opportunity to walk out of the condemned section. Once they die, their fate is sealed. Their destiny is sealed. So we preach to them now. God says it's very urgent. Every, every uh, generation has responsibility to preach to their people, to their generation. We are supposed to preach to our generation to hear the gospel quickly, because if they die, their, uh, uh, what their destiny is already sealed. They can't change it anymore. Let's look at another verse uh, in uh, John 5.24. John 5.24, Jesus is saying these words. Uh, remember all this we're quoting is Jesus' words, Jesus' own words, 5.24. Most assuredly, when Jesus said most assuredly, other King James says verily, verily. He's saying this is a very important thing. Listen to it. Most assuredly, I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has, not will have, but has eternal life. So eternal life starts here and condemnation starts here. So we who believes, the moment you believe, eternal life starts and it shall not come into judgment. Now that word judgment is not judgment there. The, the, the translation is judgment that should be condemnation. There is the, the confusion between those two. Uh, and, and shall not come into condemnation, but has passed from death to life. So there is a difference. Christians will stand in judgment before Jesus whom they have believed to get what they used his life for. When you believed, he gave you his life. You have lived 50 years on earth. How did you use my life? So we'll all stand into judgment. All of us will stand in judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. Non-believers will not stand before Jesus because they rejected him. They said, we don't like Jesus, we want God. So they will face the great white throne. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 onwards. That is the great white throne. All those who come to the great white throne will be condemned. 
they will come for judgment, but their judgment will result into condemnation. So in the Bible, there is a difference between the word judgment and condemnation. In Uganda, unfortunately, I don't know other languages, but in Uganda, they are one and the same. Omusango, omusango. And excuse me, I omusango. That is different. Omusango, we use the word judgment for musango and the word condemnation for musango. They are two different things. Omusango, you stand, we we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, including believers. But believers will not go to the great white throne because they have trusted their lives and put their trust in Jesus. For them, there is therefore now no condemnation. It doesn't say there is therefore now no judgment. No, there is therefore now no condemnation. They won't be thrown into hell. As long as they continue in faith, they will not be thrown into hell. They will not be condemned. But they will stand in, uh, uh, in the judgment. Jesus will judge his people. He judges his church. But non-believers will all be condemned. Their condemnation starts here. Let me read this again. Most as what did I say unto you? He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, has already everlasting life. So your eternal life starts here. And shall not come into condemnation, but has passed from death into life. So this is what the blood has done for us. It's a powerful thing. Now, tomorrow, because of time, I'll deal with the fifth one, which is the consequences of sin. People confuse punishment and the consequences. So tomorrow I have enough time to deal with the consequences of sin as it is different from the punishment of sin. There is the punishment of sin and there is the consequences. Those two are totally different. They confuse us very, very much here. Uh, let's end with our declarations and, and appropriating of the blood. The blood, we are dealing with the sin, studying about sin, and then applying what God has done for us. Uh, please join me as we end uh, this session by appropriating the blood. Okay. I overcome Satan, I overcome Satan. by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of my testimony, I overcome Satan when I testify personally to what the blood of Jesus does in my life. I, the redeemed of the Lord, say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Through the blood of Jesus, I am redeemed. Through the blood of Jesus, I am forgiven. Through the blood of Jesus, I am washed through the blood of Jesus. And I'm cleansed. Through the blood of Jesus, I'm declared not guilty. Through the blood of Jesus, I am acquitted. Through the blood of Jesus, I'm reckoned righteous. Through the blood of Jesus, I am made righteous. Through the blood of Jesus, I am sanctified and set apart for God. Through the blood of Jesus, I am justified. Through the blood of Jesus, I am justified, just as if I've never sinned. Through the blood of Jesus, I am reconciled to God and have peace with God. Through the blood of Jesus, Satan has no answer today or claim on me. All has been settled by the blood of Jesus. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Redeemed, washed, cleansed, and sanctified by the blood of Jesus. My members, the parts of my body, are instruments of righteousness, yielded to God for his service and for his glory. The devil has no place in me, no claim over me. All has been settled by the blood of Jesus. I have overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of my testimony. I overcome Satan when I testify personally to what the blood of Jesus does in my life. My body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for my body. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he has delivered me from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence 
from the pandemics. He has covered me with his feathers and under his wings, I take refuge. His truth is my shield and buckler. I am not afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at my side, 10,000 at my right hand, millions all over the nations because of this pandemic, but it shall not come near me. Only with my eyes shall I look and see the reward of the wicked. Because I have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, my dwelling place, no evil shall befall me, nor shall any plague come near my house. For he has given his angels charge over me to keep me in all my ways. In their hands, they bear me up, lest I dash my foot against a stone. I tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. I trample underfoot because I have set my love upon him. Therefore, he delivers me. He has set me on high because I know him, his name. I call upon him and he answers me. He's with me in trouble. He delivers me and honors me. With long life, he satisfies me and shows me salvation. I tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, I tread on the foot. God bless you. Back to Pastor Dale. Have a good day, a good Sunday.